When I saw the formula for the strain tensor the very first time, I found that it looks unnecessarily complicated. Why is it not possible to simply define the strain tensor as the gradient of the displacement field? Well, it turns out that this would result in some unphysical behavior. Take for example this simulation, where I apply some displacement in x1 direction to the top of a solid cube. If I run the same simulation but with the wrong definition for the strain tensor, the results look much less realistic. In this video you will learn why. Continuum mechanics studies the deformation of matter under external influences. To do so, it is necessary to somehow quantify the deformation of matter mathematically. The displacement field, which is a vector field that describes the displacement of each point, carries information about the deformation of matter. However, the displacement field does not only carry information about deformation, it also carries information about the translation and rotation of matter. Take for example this displacement field, which leads to a translation of matter. Or this displacement field, which leads to a rotation of matter. For both examples, the matter is not deforming, but just moving in space. This is called rigid body motion. We observe that the displacement field is not really suited to quantify the deformation of matter. To measure the deformation of matter, we desire a physical quantity that is zero where the matter is not deformed and non-zero elsewhere. This quantity is the strain tensor epsilon. The strain measures how displacement is changing in space. For problems in one dimension, the strain is the derivative of the displacement field. In three dimensions, however, the displacement field is a vector field with three components u1, u2 and u3, which can each change in space in all three directions x1, x2 and x3. This means we can compute a total of nine derivatives. These nine derivatives define the gradient of the displacement field, which is denoted by nabla u. Recognizing that the strain in one dimension is the derivative of the displacement field, a seemingly natural choice for defining the strain tensor in three dimensions would be that the strain tensor is the gradient of the displacement field. Spoiler, we shouldn't do that. But let's anyways think this idea through. Let's take a look at the previous displacement field examples. In the case of rigid body translation, the displacement gradient is zero. Great, this is what we wanted. The matter is translating in space, but it is not deforming and the strain is zero. But what happens for the other example? For rigid body rotation, the displacement gradient is non-zero. This means that the displacement gradient does not only contain information about the deformation of matter, but also information about the rotation of matter. Now the following question arises. Can we take the displacement gradient and somehow remove all contributions that belong to rotation? If this would be possible, then all we would have left would be a good measure of deformation. Guess what? It is possible to do that. All we need is a short mathematical interlude. A tensor A can be additively decomposed into two parts, a symmetric and a skew symmetric part. Let's assume that A is a 3 by 3 tensor here. The formula for the symmetric part is 1 half times A plus A transposed. If we expand this formula, we can see why this is called the symmetric part of A. The upper right and lower left off diagonal elements of the symmetric part are equal. The formula for the skew symmetric part is 1 half times A minus A transposed. Again, expanding the formula, we can see why this is called the skew symmetric part of A. The upper right and lower left off diagonal elements of the skew symmetric part are equal in magnitude, but change in sign. If you like, pause the video and quickly verify that the symmetric plus the skew symmetric part equals A.
Let's go back to the displacement gradient. We have seen that the rotation of matter resulted in a non-zero displacement gradient. Now take a look at the following. No matter how the matter is rotated, the displacement gradient always shows a certain pattern. It is always skew symmetric. It turns out that the rotation of matter is directly linked to the skew symmetric part of the displacement gradient. This means by subtracting the skew symmetric part of the displacement gradient, we can remove all contributions that arise from rotations. So let's do it. Let's write down the displacement gradient minus the skew symmetric part of it. After some rearrangements, we get this. Here we have it. This is the formula for the strain tensor. Now we know why this formula looks strange at the first glance. The strain tensor is the displacement gradient minus all contributions that arise from rotations. What is left is the symmetric part of the displacement gradient. I personally find this derivation super intriguing because it once more shows that every formula that we use in physics does not come from nowhere. There's always a reason for a formula looking kind of weird. And in this case, there's no black magic in defining the strain tensor. All we needed was a measure for the deformation of matter. The displacement gradient was a good choice to start with, but it also included rotation, which we had to remove to arrive at the proper measure of deformation, the strain tensor. Let's finally go back to the simulation that I've shown in the very beginning of the video. Here you can see the boundary value problem that I solved numerically for simulating the deformation of the solid block under shear. If we change the definition for the strain tensor such that it equals the displacement gradient, that is, we include rotation into the strain tensor, then we get a much less realistic behavior of the solid. The reason for this is that now the rotation of matter would also contribute to the stress in the matter. Therefore, we get an unrealistically stiff matter. So we should stick to the correct definition of the strain tensor. At the end, there's one important thing that must be mentioned about the strain tensor. The strain tensor that has been discussed in this video is only suitable for measuring deformations that are very small. This strain tensor is therefore called the small strain tensor or infinitesimal strain tensor. All displacements and strains shown in this video have been amplified for illustration purposes. But note that the small strain tensor should only be used for strains that do not exceed 1 or maximum 2%. For larger deformations, different tensors are required to correctly quantify the strain. But this we will have to postpone to future videos on nonlinear continuum mechanics. That's it for this video. In an upcoming video in the series of videos on continuum mechanics, I will show you how the strain tensor and its individual elements can be visualized. Stay tuned!